Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing all of us together. And we know we come because we want to learn about Jesus, our King, and what His kingdom is all about. And for that, we know it cannot be from a man. We need the Holy Spirit. So come, Holy Spirit. Will you be with me as I share? Be with everyone who is listening in, both here physically and others who will be listening in from SoundCloud. And we want Jesus to be glorified, so we proclaim your name, Lord. And we say, Lord, as we go through this teaching, have your way in each of our hearts. So we thank you and we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This evening, the title is very straightforward, is uh, inspired from that TV game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And we're asking a very simple question, who wants to be a prophet? Who wants to be a prophet? If you look at the graphics, there are many hands that are stuck up there. And I like to presume that, you know, today, the prophetic is quite popular. Uh, everyone wants to be a prophet, I think. Yeah? Well, is it good? Is it bad? Is it right? Is it wrong? I think that's what we're going to explore this evening a little bit more. But since this is the final session of our year and also of the mini-series of Matthew chapter 13, it is good to do a little recap so that for those who have not heard this or joining us after a while, this would be also a good introduction. Now, we know that in the book of Matthew, really there are five major teachings or discourses. We've gone through the first one, which is really the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7. I call it Kingdom Ways. In discourse 2, which is Matthew chapter 10, I label it as Kingdom Assignments because this is about Jesus sending his disciples out and then teaching them and telling them what to expect. Over the past few sessions, we've been going through the third discourse. It's about the kingdom parables, Matthew chapter 13. All the parables we've already gone through one at a time. But broadly, I refer to this as the kingdom OS, the kingdom operating system. Jesus talks about the mysteries of the kingdom. How does the kingdom operate? And he speaks all these things through parables. And I hope we have been learning as we have been journeying. Then there are two more, uh, the discourse number four, which is Matthew 18, which we'll get to soon enough, and also the fifth discourse, which is kingdom readiness. The fourth one is about kingdom community, and the fifth about kingdom readiness. Now, we've come already quite a way in discourse number three, and we have reached the final section. We have reached the end of this discourse. And each time Matthew records it with that line, and now it came to pass when Jesus had finished, or when the time came for this to have happened, or when this had happened. That's how Matthew rounds up a discourse. When Jesus had finished these parables. Now, what are these parables? We've gone through seven. In fact, I gave you one the last time, plus one more. It's a bonus. There are actually eight parables in there. We've seen the heart condition and how people respond, the sower and the soils. Then Jesus went to the parable of wheat and tares, and really it's a lesson about the coexistence of both the good as well as the evil and a final separation that comes at the end of the age. Then he spoke two more parables, the one of the mustard seed and one more of the leaven. And we know it's about the extent of the kingdom as well as the effect or the impact of the kingdom. He goes on to the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price. And this is really about the worth, the value of the kingdom. And if you understand the value of the kingdom of God, you will give up everything. You will throw away everything and anything for the sake of receiving the fullness of this kingdom. And then there's the parable of the dragnet, and it's all about fishes. It's about gathering once again, and finally again, a separation. You gather all sorts, but at the end, all these will be sorted out. And that bonus parable at the end was the one of the house master to say that if you understand these things, then you'll be like a scribe, discipled in the things of the kingdom, and you will bring out like a house master treasures both new and old, and you'll begin to throw it out. You will dispense of these to the people around you. So when it came to pass, finally, when Jesus finished all these parables, he departed from them. And so we come to this section of Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 to 58. I read you 53 already, and let me read you from verse 54 onwards, and let's see what this passage really talks about. 
When Jesus had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This little passage here is really a transition. And it summarizes all that we've been going through in Matthew chapter 13, as well as introduces the next part. Now, in between the discourses, you will find narratives, stories, descriptions of the ministry of Jesus. Here we learn that Jesus goes back to his hometown, Nazareth. And in fact, his own ministry now is being questioned and rejected by his own people in his own hometown and even his own family, I believe. And they were asked, where did this man get all this wisdom? Obviously, they would have heard him teach and they would have heard reports of his miracles and his mighty works. It's like, wow, we, we hear it. Uh, I, I guess we would have seen it, but you sure not. And where, where do you get all these things? And then they were offended because he was just a commoner like many of them. They got offended. Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Very straightforward, very simple passage. He goes back, he gets rejected. But let's see what we can learn from this thing as we look at two observations first. The first observation I see, if you remember the key point of Matthew chapter 13, it's all about hearing and understanding. The soul and the soils, all about hearing and all about understanding. And Matthew chapter 13, this passage here, 53 to 58, becomes like an immediate example of people who hear, but they do not understand. They have no faith. They will not get what Jesus is saying, or they will refuse to get it. And that's the first observation. Quite interesting that Matthew should summarize the entire chapter with this one passage. The second observation, and that's where you need to see a broader context, is that these parables are sandwiched between two passages about family and faith. Right at the end of chapter 12, now we've left that for a while now, is a teaching about family. Who is really my family? Remember Jesus said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he concludes after teaching that to say, here are my mother and my brothers, whoever does the will of my father in heaven. Now these are my brother, my sister, and my mother. In other words, a kingdom family is of a greater significance and importance. The family of faith has a higher value than even our physical relationships and our natural families on earth. And then we see in Matthew chapter 13, in this passage, verse 53 to 58, specifically in these two verses, they ask, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and the brother so-and-so and his sisters, are they not with us again? Again, a mention about family. And then Jesus then says, okay, what? They're not only my family. You guys, come on, we are from the same family. We are Israel. We are brethren. And then they get upset with him. Then Matthew says, he couldn't do any of these works because of their lack of faith or their unbelief. So these parables are then sandwiched again between this greater perspective of family and faith. Matthew closes this chapter or this whole teaching with a rejection of the ministry of Jesus. Now look at this picture once again. When we talk about the sower, he is the one that sows the seed. The seed is the word of God. The one who sows is the one who declares. Do you realize that there's a prophetic element, a prophetic declaration that comes from the one who sows? Anyone who declares the things about the kingdom of God, there's a prophetic aspect in that. Secondly, right at the end, a housemaster who throws out, who dishes out, who declares, who disperses the treasures of the kingdom. Can you see? There's also prophetic insight bringing out these treasures and a prophetic declaration of teaching and declaring the things of the kingdom. And so it's sandwiched again with a prophetic element down there. 
And in case you think this prophetic ministry will be readily accepted by all, you need to think again. Matthew is almost saying that, okay, look at all these parables. You can say and say and say, talk and talk, declare and declare all you want and be as precise as you can be. This is the possible kind of reaction, of reception and even rejection that prophets can expect. So let's ask the question that we started with. So who wants to be a prophet? Who wants to be a prophet? But before you answer this too quickly, whether is it that, oh yes, you know, I want to be a prophet, or no, I don't think so. Let's learn a little bit more about the prophet as well as the prophetic ministry. I think this is helpful for us because sometimes in our contemporary understanding or with the words that we use in the church, we can use it so easily and familiarly that we don't even understand what the significance really is. So let's get into a little teaching here and ask ourselves, so what's a prophet? Let's understand it from an Old Testament perspective because that's where we encounter these guys first. There are a couple of terms that a prophet is known by. One is, of course, this word called prophet. Next one is called a man of God. Straightforward, a man of God. And a prophet is in town, man of God is here. He or she is called a seer. Now, what do these terms really mean? The word prophet, in its understanding of the language, has a nuance or a notion of one who is called or one who is appointed. Someone who is specially set aside or set apart to be used in this function of a prophet. So even in that name, the term prophet, there is an understanding of that, of an appointment. Secondly, man of God. Now, it sounds so impressive, right or not? Well, just flip it around. It just means God's man. (laughs) Amen? Right? A man of God is God's man. So in other words, someone who belongs to God, right? That's all. That's what it means. Someone who belongs to God, he will be God's messenger and God's servant. That's all it means. It's a man of God. The third one is a seer, and immediately, I think, in our minds, we will have this perception to say that, oh, this guy has has dreams and has visions. He he sees things. Well, not wrong, but it's more than just visions and dreams. You know, when we use this phrase, and let's say if I explain something to you, and you go, oh, I see. Now, what do you see? It's not a vision, right? What you're saying is that, oh, I understand. Oh, I see what you mean. Right? So in the Hebrew, it has the same kind of a context and that same kind of a, a perspective to say one who understands, he sees it. There's a perception, there's a perspective that he has. He has a spiritual insight. He gets a spiritual foresight. He can see certain things. He understands it. There's a power of perception and discernment. And I believe we call it kingdom wisdom and kingdom perspective. He understands things from a different perspective. So even from the terms, you see a prophet has all these little connotations. One who is set apart or appointed by God. One who belongs to God, just God's person. And one who has a necessary wisdom, insight, foresight to be able to speak into a situation. Well, a prophet is also characterized by two things, and broadly is wisdom and works. Now, if you remember this passage, which or this verse, which we just read just now, when Jesus had come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Right? Look at these two things. Now, why did they use this phrasing? Now, where did they get this idea? I believe it originated with the first great prophet, which is Moses. Moses was Israel, like number one de facto prophet. And in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 10 to 12, it is recorded right at the end. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses. Now, how did they understand this prophet? He had wisdom, right? He received the law. He came down, he declared, he was prophetic in that nature. He also uh, displayed great mighty power against Egypt and also in all of Israel. So there's wisdom as well as there's works. 
But in the time of Moses, he also pointed to one who will be like him. So we see in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 19, he actually told Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And you and I know today who he was talking about because we know this prophecy has already been fulfilled. And Israel was always looking out for who this might be. Was it this one? This prophet comes. Was it this one? Is it this one? And finally, when Jesus comes on, Jesus taught with great wisdom, great authority. He performed great and mighty works. In fact, in Luke chapter 7, verse 1, when Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead, the people responded by saying, a great prophet has arisen among us. Look at that language, right? Where did they get that language? Because they knew there was a prophecy and they were wondering, could Jesus be the one? Now, some of them recognized Jesus as the great prophet, but to the people of his own hometown, ayo, where did this man get all his wisdom and get his mighty works? Could, could, it, be, could it be Jesus of Nazareth? Nah, cannot be. I mean, this guy grew up with us. Is this not the carpenter's son? I mean, make tables, okay, you know, build some walls, that's cool. Fix the kitchen cabinet, nice. But prophet, I mean, come on. How can a carpenter be a prophet? You see, sometimes we are all very slow of of learning, isn't it? If you look back at all the great prophets, actually many of them started out as nothing. Can anyone be a prophet if God picks that person? If God empowers that person, nothing is impossible for God. So how can he? How can he be Jesus? He's, he's one of us. How can he be this great prophet? And they forget the prophecy of Moses to say that he will be from your brethren. He will be from amongst one of you. So the prophet comes with wisdom and he comes with mighty works. Then we have to ask, where does he get his prophetic inspiration? What makes a prophet a prophet? How does he prophesy? And where does he get this wisdom and all these things from? The three words are spirit, word, and prayer. Let me explain each one to you. The first one is obviously obvious. (laughs) It's the Holy Spirit. Every time the Old Testament reports about a prophet, it will say the Spirit of God came upon this person and he started to prophesy. That's where divine inspiration comes from. It's by the Spirit of God because by ourselves, we can't understand these things. We will try to figure it out with our brain, our intellect, our experience and our know-how. As smart as we think we are, we cannot understand spiritual things. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, this is what Peter actually says. For prophecy never came by the will of men. You don't decide for yourself what you want to say. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Prophetic inspiration comes by divine inspiration by the Holy Spirit. The second source is the Word. And the prophets were divinely guided and directed by, get this, it was the law of God. Every time they spoke something, And they told Israel, the people, guys, you are out of line. Now, how did they know you're out of line? They knew the word of God. They knew the law. They knew Deuteronomy superbly well. And they say, if you follow, if you look according to this, you are out of alignment. And inspired by the Holy Spirit, guided by the word of God, God will tell them, this is what you need to say. Now, here's a beautiful thing. God's words, His law, became their words. It's really exciting because then their words became God's words. In particular, I like this one verse in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1. That after Samuel receives or gets a revelation of the word of God, this verse records, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. You notice it wasn't the word of God who came to all Israel. It was the word of Samuel who came to all Israel. Now, why is that legit? Because when God's word becomes your word, your word becomes God's word. And this is awesome. It's amazing, right? The prophetic inspiration, unction comes. Your word is received as if the word of God. 
The third one is prayer, and prayer really is a descriptor of divine communion and fellowship with God. It's a relationship. You cannot speak all these things by yourself. You can't. You need to have a connection with God. And out of that, you get divine counsel and you get divine wisdom. Jeremiah 23 verse 18 says, For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has received and heard His word? And this was Jeremiah having a, having a go at the false prophets. He's saying, look, don't listen to these false guys. They call themselves prophets. But really, they are prophesying out of their own will and their understanding. Because these guys haven't been in the presence of God. So if you want a prophetic understanding and a prophetic inspiration, why prayer? Because prayer is communion with God. You're spending time with Him. You're drawing from Him. You get aligned with Him. And the more you're aligned with Him, the more you're capable of speaking for Him. Let's go on then. Then what would be the prophet's function? What's a prophet supposed to be doing? What, what's the objective? And these two words I think you've heard of before. One is a fourth teller, and the other one is a foreteller. To forth tell, or if we put it the other way, to tell forth, to speak forth, simply means to proclaim the word, to proclaim the truth of God as well as his kingdom. To foretell is to tell before something happens, and that is to predict what God will do. Now, I quickly must add, uh, foretelling uh, is different from fortune-telling. <laughs> do you understand the difference? It's, it's, I know it sounds different, but sometimes Christians also have their Christian fortune-telling uh, superstitions. Okay, so to foretell... It's a little bit different from the fortune telling. Now, in the other religious or spiritual understanding of fortune tellers, their sources are very different. Uh, they consult spirits, they consult different items, they do not consult the Spirit of God. Their motives are very different. The focus is very, very different. You go and read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 15. God forbids forbids. Okay, so please, as Christians, please don't go and quadi, yeah? don't go and get fortune telling. And sometimes we say, no, I don't go fortune telling. There's a prophet in town, so I go and ask the prophet what you know, he can tell me. Still the same problem, right? Yeah? If it's all about you, it's still not correct. Now, before I explain a little bit more what the focus really should be, I want you to see that scriptures really is a prophetic book. And we have to learn not to see it in bits and pieces. We have to see that from Genesis to Revelation is a prophetic book. It's a declaration of God, Jesus as king, and all about his kingdom. So you have to go from one end to the other end, Genesis to Revelation, and understand a prophetic meta-narrative. That's the prophetic backdrop. That's the whole background. That's the whole context now, once you see this and you understand, you take a step back, then you will realize that whether they foretell or whether they foretell, the focus is always on God and His kingdom. Always. Right? It may appear personal or it may appear situational, but it has to connect back to what it has to do with God as well as His entire kingdom. That's what true prophets do. It's a declaration of who God is, Jesus also, and what He stands for, right? And those are the ways of the kingdom. He's holy, He's righteous, He demands justice, right? And after that, the prophet will give an assessment, if needed, of how God's people have fed or how they have veered, right? So you look at the Old Testament prophets, they always tell them, look, you have gone so far off. Can you please come back? Can you please return? So they invite them. It's an invitation then to turn and to return to God. And in there, you see also a warning of impending judgment. And that's where the foretelling comes. They say, look, if you don't do this, this is going to happen. Now, this is going to happen. So that's why I'm telling you, come on, get in line with God. 
Okay? The prophets don't go, this is going to happen. So you buy stocks and shares, huh? This is going to happen, huh? So you don't invest in this, okay? Huh? That, that's not the idea. The point is, this is going to happen. So you've got to ask yourself, which side are you on? Where are you? Are you lined up or not lined up? See, this is the prophetic function. And at the end, there will always be, you look at the prophetic books and the, and the word, a promise of salvation. And salvation is, to the prophets, it's not one point, uh, believe in Jesus and go to heaven. Th- that's not what they say. Salvation to them is an entire concept from Genesis to Revelation. It's a salvation of everyone and everything and the restoration of all things again. It's a promise of restoration. It's a promise of hope. So from Genesis and Revelation, this is the entire backdrop. If you want to prophesy, if you want to receive a word of prophecy, you have to ask yourself, okay, it's fine. So this is said for me, this helps me, but how, what does it have to do connecting to God's entire meta-narrative? Now, if you trace this timeline, then you start to see in the beginning it was for the nation of Israel. Later, it was to guide the kings so that the kings can guide the people of Israel. But when king after king messed up and Israel spiraled more and more downwards, you'll start to see that the prophecy pointed now to a Messiah, a coming king that would make all things okay. The prophecy began to move people from hopelessness to a a hope of salvation. And the prophecy is extended now from Israel to the rest of the world. See, this is the prophetic ministry. This prophetic ministry operates against this backdrop and the context. So when you look at the prophets from Moses all the way through to the last of the Old Testament, which is really John the Baptist, and he hands over the prophetic mantle to Jesus, can you see there is a unity and a continuity if you don't understand this, then you begin to see, oh, Old Testament prophets uh, is like that one. And New Testament prophets is different. One is before Jesus, one is after Jesus. Friends, the backdrop is the same. We are still moving on this timeline in case you don't realize. Certain things have been fulfilled, but other things have not. And there's a foretelling and a reminding of all of us so that we can still look towards that timeline and to understand, are we aligned with God's prophetic move and His timeline? The New Testament prophets then began after Jesus and after that, the church. So today, when we look at ourselves as the church, do you know that we are a prophetic kingdom community? And this is a broad statement, but you can study this and I think you will agree with me. And how did it start? Jesus goes up and he says, wait, wait for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes down, poured out on all flesh, fulfills a prophecy of Joel chapter 2 verse 28. And it fulfills another one even earlier. It's in, it's in Numbers chapter 11 verse 29, where Moses said to this person, are you zealous for my sake? All oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets. And at that time, when the Holy Spirit fell on the, on the 70 elders and they prophesied, and then there were two more outside that caught also, right? The prophetic mantle and say, hey, can you stop them from prophesying? And Moses said, hello, you don't even know what you're talking. I wish all of you would prophesy. Because God doesn't want to limit this to only a few special individuals. The Holy Spirit is given so that we can all have that divine inspiration and that divine prophetic unction. Oh, that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. And that's why in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Every time we testify about Jesus, every time we declare Jesus and His kingdom, the spirit of the prophetic mantle is there. You're declaring things, you're speaking things into being and contributing to the entire timeline. Paul starts to teach in the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says that, don't you know, that one of these aspects is the gift of prophecy. And if all of us have the Holy Spirit, this is available to each and every person in the body of Christ. The second is the Word. 
The Word became flesh and dwells among us. The Word becomes incarnate as we believe now. The Word becomes a part of us. We are part of this Word. We are now guided and directed not only by the written Word, but we have a relationship with the living Word, and we are governed and guided by the Spirit of this living Word. So just like the prophets of old, but today all of us who believe in Jesus, we have the Spirit, we have the Word, no excuse. And we also have a relationship with Jesus, with the King of Kings. We have direct access to God. Prayer is a privilege that we have, that we can enter this throne room of God. We can petition. We can have a confidence and a boldness to have this conversation with Him. We have fellowship with the King. And the more you pray, the more you align with the heartbeat of God. You know, one of the biggest challenges for the church and, or for local churches, the prayer ministry is the one that is most challenged. Even for a ministry like our Keepers Awakening or any other ministry, it's so easy to neglect this function of prayer. And in the beginning, we will pray harder because we don't know what's happening. But when we have things happening, we neglect this area of prayer, forgetting that now we know what to do. All the more we need prayer to undergird what God has shown us to do. You see, we have the Spirit, we have the Word, we have direct access to God. We, the church, we are a prophetic people. I would love you to say an amen. A bit more convincing. Lah. <laughs> we, the church, we are a prophetic people. And remember the, the definition of, or the terms that were used in the Old Testament of the prophet? Someone who is set apart and appointed Someone who's called, friends, are we all called, yes or no? We are, right? To a different degree, at different levels, but there's no, there's no question to each of us being called and set apart holy ones, the saints, appointed by God for different aspects. Now, some of us can, will be more frontline to be prophets, but others, for all of us, we are to be prophetic. So don't look at this one word prophet and say, no, 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 I'm not prophet. It's okay if you're not a prophet, but you're prophetic. I may not be termed as a prophet, but we are prophetic. Okay, that's the first thing. Second, man of God means God's man. Woman of God means God's woman. Are you God's man and are you God's woman? Do you belong to God? Do you belong to Jesus? If you do, you are God's man and you're God's woman. We all belong to Him. So we are all His servants. We are all His messengers. We are all His proclaimers. The seer, remember this word? So I'm asking you, do you see? Everyone say, oh, I see. <laughs> I know you hear, but Jesus says you hear, but I must have understanding. Right? So it's not just dreams and visions as much as I would be glad for all of us to have that kind of uh, ability. But not all may have that. But can we all understand? And Jesus says, I've already thrown open the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, whether you want to hear or not, all depends on the condition of your heart. And after you hear, will you understand? Because the prophecy that keeps getting fulfilled over and over again is that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 6. Hearing, they do not hear. Seeing, they do not see. And they do not understand. And I think this is a plight that the church is facing. We're hearing message after message after message after message. We're hearing, but we're not understanding. See, the church is a prophetic community. And so if you understand this now, let me ask you again, who wants to be a prophet? Who wants to be a prophet? You know, I don't claim to know everything about the prophetic. That's not really my main area of my gifting and so for the rest of this time, I like to draw from the teaching and authority of scriptures and mostly by Paul, just to give us a few pointers to define this ministry a little bit more. Because Paul taught extensively about the prophetic to the people of God. What's the prophetic ministry about? Who is it for? And as I studied this again, as I prepared for this message, one thing is very clear that primarily it's for the people of God. It's for the body of Christ. Now, unbelievers can benefit from this, but primarily as I read this, when Paul taught the church, it was really that we handle it well so that we can benefit 
from this gift that the Lord has given. As with all the other gifts of the Holy Spirit, the prophetic assignment is for the prophet and for the good of the body of Christ. It's for us. And so if we don't use it, and if we don't harness it, and we don't employ this correctly, then we miss out on what God has for us. It's for the profit of all. And that's why he says to the church in Corinth, pursue love, desire the gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So if you're not moving yet in the prophetic, I'm standing on scripture and asking you, earnestly desire. It's okay. I don't know what the teachings you've gone through or not gone through or what the tradition you may have grown up with. I'm standing on this scripture and Paul is saying, desire, pursue, that you may prophesy. Desire earnestly to prophesy. Because it's a gift for the body of Christ. And he goes on here, he clarifies. He says, he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. This is what you get to do. You get to edify, exhort, encourage, and also comfort the body of Christ. He who prophesies edifies the church. You, you actually build up the church. But let me qualify something here. Please don't take this out of context to mean that prophets only speak nice things and prophets cannot offend. Because if you look at these three words, it seems to suggest that, right? Huh? That if I were to bring a hard word or a harsh word, then wrong. How can comfort with a harsh word? Now let's remember again the prophetic backdrop, the entire kingdom backdrop. You see, in the time of Paul's writing, it was not easy to be a Christian. Not that it's any easier today. But they were being persecuted, they were being chased out, they were being all that. You know? And I believe Paul was writing in that context to say, look at this, you're losing property, you're being persecuted, you're chased out of this place, you know, it looks like as if you guys uh, are, are the scum of the earth and being beaten and being so everything. Let me build you up. Let me tell you what prophecy says. Let me tell you what the kingdom of God is. Let me tell you that you have a hope. Let me tell you that you are going to stay to the end. Amen? You see, so he builds up the church. He encourages the church. He says, please don't lose hope. Hang on to that because you have a great salvation. Don't you ever give this up. I comfort you because our, our life may end now, but we have eternal life. They can persecute the body, but they cannot persecute the spirit which is within us. You see, this is what Paul means when he says, we build up the church in that way. It's not the today, the, what we call the strawberry generation prophecy. Where every small thing, and you, uh, God love you, la, God sayang you, la, and God will never hit you, one, la, God will never get angry with you. La, that says the Lord. That's not the kind of prophecy I believe Paul was saying. Now, it's, it's okay if you want to encourage someone. Maybe you need to lift someone up in that way, yes? But you've got to toughen the body of Christ up in the midst of the challenges that we are facing or may be facing. And yes, God loves you. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. But can we understand the context of what Paul is saying when he says that he's saying in the context of persecution and struggles and very, very difficult times. So build up the church against the dismal outlook. It looks as if like, you know, we are, we are losing the battle. Remember the parable. Jesus says, no stress, don't worry. You will grow side by side, yes? The wheat and the tares. And you think you're, you're, not, you're not getting any better or the church is losing ground and all that. Prophecy comes in and tells you, stand firm. That's what the prophetic is about. The prophet is led by the Spirit, but he is still in control of how he prophesies. The, the prophet gets a, the inspiration, a word, a leading but he doesn't go into a frenzy or an ecstasy and any, you know, try to drama and you know, sound a bit more spiritual, flow in on clouds. He doesn't do that. Order is still needed in the house. And God, through his prophetic voices, will not bring confusion and there should not be any competition of whose prophetic voice is louder than whose. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32, 
The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. God does not uh, take control of you to a point where you lose your entire personality. That's not the case. You are still able to control, know when to release, when to say, how to say, and even defer to other brothers and sisters in the body. And I believe Paul was addressing some misuse or abuse of the prophetic in the church at that point in time. And yet, to have order doesn't mean no prophecy allowed. Right? You can swing to the other extreme. And this is the problem with the body of Christ. On one end, anything goes. On the other end, everything also cannot. So Paul says, look, you have a freedom to prophesy. But there's order. But in the order, don't quench the Holy Spirit. <laughs> because prophetic inspiration is by the Holy Spirit. If you tell someone, stop prophesying, then you're shutting down the move of the Holy Spirit. So do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. And I can tell you this is happening in the church. Right? First, no prophecy. After that, too many prophecies. Then it's like everything also must prophesy. So... Too much also cannot. Too little also cannot. So how? Can you see how hopeless we are? Thank God for His grace. So both excesses are not healthy. Do not despise prophecies. You have a freedom to prophesy. But you don't get to set new things. You prophesy under the whole framework and that's how you stay safe. And you know how God wants you to move. Then He says, test everything. See, how do you safeguard between the everything also can or everything also cannot? If and when there's prophecy, test the prophecy. Prophets are to be held accountable. It's not come, say, and then chow and run away, which tends to be the situation these days. In fact, this morning, I opened up an email, one of the newsletters from Charisma, and some of you received that. It says it's a problem these days. They call them social media prophets. There's this social media prophets because they are like social media influencers. So they influence thousands, if not millions of people. And then they put up all these um, prophetic things and no one is accountable to whether or not those things are true or not. Right? It bypasses certain leadership, which is, of course, uh, dangerous. So all prophecies, it's subjected to be tested by leaders, elders, and collectively with the body. So if you're not clear about a prophecy, whether it's a personal or corporate, um, general, talk to each other. You understand? You, know, you have to test this out. And four simple things, very quickly. Does it conform with scripture and doctrine? Right? It's, uh, it's about the word. Does it conform with scripture and doctrine? Today we have come to a place where we prefer feelings, how it feels, versus what doctrine it is. Okay, so that's the first one. Second one, does a prophecy glorify Jesus and the church? Is it about Jesus, the kingdom, uh, the body of Christ, the kingdom of God? Or is a prophecy just everything all about you and, and, and the stock market and uh, who's going to get elected? What is it? Okay, does it glorify Jesus or not? Thirdly, do you have the consensus of the elders, the leaders? Collective discernment. Talk to some people. That's why, that's why we need to be in a community. We need to, to hang out with one another so that we can check each other because we have got blind spots. Fourthly, does it have a consistency, this prophecy, across the body of Christ? You see, God does not just do one small thing down here and then you have the monopoly to that. No. When God wants to speak, He speaks across the entire body. And it's a global thing because he's moving in an unprecedented way in these final days. And because of the internet, we, are, we have access to this information now. When God wants to move something, he will share all these things with us for the entire body. So four things. Scriptures, does it glorify Jesus? Consensus with elders and consistency across the body of Christ. See, when we look at prophecy, we also must be careful. We shouldn't look at prophecy or, or the prophetic as receiving new revelation. Can I boldly say, if this is a prophetic book and we say this is canonized, then the revelation that God wants us to have is inside down here. You understand? But what we want is fresh understanding of what it means. 
You get my point here? Okay, now I'm not saying that uh, I'm a King James Bible guy. You know, that's not the point. Right? But if, he, if we understand the backdrop of Genesis to Revelation, this book is a prophetic book and we're not adding anything to it. All we are doing is drawing from it and understanding in the context of this whole prophetic um, scriptural framework. The themes recur over and over again from the Old Testament to the New. There's nothing new under the sun. And this is just me being naughty. I'm just wondering, maybe we like something new because we don't want to move on what we already know. So it's always more novel, right? Yeah? Something new, something new. That's why the most famous, the most favorite passage is you know, God is doing a new thing. <laughs> yeah, and as you cross into the new year, oh, we've got a new year, and, you know, everything we've been thrown already. The old has passed, the new has come. I know. Right? But if you understand prophecy properly, it's recurring. What you need is a fresh understanding of what it is. Wisdom. So that you can handle and move on what God has already shown. The prophetic ministry is not a walk in the park. There's every possibility of no honor, no regard, no respect, rejection, and even persecution. So in this passage that we are studying... They looked at Jesus, they couldn't believe this guy, hometown boy, grew up like that. Wow, are you sure? They discount all the miracles, all the wisdom. And Jesus came up with this very, very familiar proverb. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. And there has to be some truth in it, because this is a proverb, a wisdom saying. Familiarity breeds contempt. That's our modern way of understanding it. We just can't for our life, we can't imagine that God will use the ordinary. We cannot imagine that God will use the one that we grew up with, the, the boy or the girl next door. In fact, I think it's in it in all of us that we prefer someone else, someone bigger, someone more. Wow. Those who are parents here, you understand, right? Huh? We always lament. You see, la, we tell our children, don't want to listen to us. Huh? The friends say, everything also do. Huh? Teacher, tell them, very good. Mentor, ayo. But the parents say, no one wants to listen. So it's a very typical thing, you understand? It's like a familiar voice we, we don't want to listen to. Uh, pastors of local churches, I mean, it's tough, right? You, you hear the same voice every other week, week in, week out. They preach the same message to you. They do the very best. And you get a guest speaker come in and everyone goes, wow, so anointed. <laughs> so it happens. Or locally, you know, as Singaporeans, right, uh, members uh, may, may welcome us and they, they value us and so on. But the moment you have a guest speaker from a foreign, overseas, uh, foreign-sounding name, whoa, the hall is full. <laughs> Honor and respect somehow, you know, is somewhere else. But you see, as much as our prophetic ministry or our ministry is not regarded as well locally or within the people, you notice if God takes you out somewhere else, you get that honor, correct? You'll find it somewhere else. And so let's view it positively. Huh? Don't look at this line and say, you see, la, no one value me, no one honor me. Let's look at it positively. Because if we understand that we need to get into somewhere else, then it forces us to be willing to get out of a comfort zone. The God may want to take you out sometimes because He wants to honor you in some other place, but for that you need to get out of your comfort zone. And not only that, it then forces a cross-migration of the body of Christ that I will bless you, you will bless this congregation, this congregation will bless them, and we exchange resources and there's a freshness in the body of Christ. Is that amen? It also challenges us and reminds us that there's no place for pride. No place for pride. In fact, humility is required to accept that we will not be honored by everyone and most especially those that we would like to get honor from. And we have to accept that God will use someone else to accomplish what you may not be able to achieve. And this is nothing about your talents and nothing about your abilities. God will use the weakness of human nature to accomplish the purposes of the body of Christ. So as we learn about the nature of the prophetic ministry, I think it helps us understand a little bit more, right? The challenges and the plights of prophets who are true, true huh? to a kingdom assignment. You can prophesy all you want. And I can tell you, people love to hear prophecies. 
but how many actually respond to the prophetic word? Very, very painful sometimes, right? They like the good stuff, but they don't want the bad stuff. And that's why many of the prophets were rejected, killed by their own people. And prophets, as far as I can gather, they were mostly lonely and misunderstood. Not all the time. And I'm not saying that if you are popular, that means you are a false prophet. That's not the idea. No, that's not the point, okay? But I'm saying that there's every possibility because if you are preaching the kingdom of God, if you are preaching the truth, some people can't take it. And a lot will not want to take it. Prophets and persecution, if you realize, they were mentioned together by Jesus many times. Every time he talks about persecution, he used the prophets as an example. So who wants to be a prophet? All right, he says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of things of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so prophetic people, <laughs> if you're saying what you should be saying, you should be getting the same treatment. And everyone said, Amen. <laughs> but notice this, huh? the sad truth is this, that the persecution comes from within the system. Get this truth. Huh? The persecution comes from within the system, from the people of God, from so-called spiritual leaders and God's people. Because they don't want the kingdom of God. They want a religious model. It's safer. And no one wants to admit that something is not right. And that's why they will persecute the prophets. Who are you to come and tell me all these kind of things? You're not edifying, you're not comforting, you're not encouraging, you're tearing us down. And then the persecution starts. Jesus, as the great prophet, warned that if he was rejected and persecuted, his followers can expect the same. I'm not saying all will be subject to this, but I'm saying the possibility is always there. So friends, who wants to be a prophet? Can I tell you the answer? You don't have a choice. We are to be a prophetic community. Right? Prophets are God's kingdom representatives. That's us. Prophets are God's alignment agents to point people back to God. That's us. You see, the church is a prophetic people. We all, whether you like it or not, we all have a prophetic assignment. And our assignments, whatever they are, even if you don't call yourself a prophet, they are prophetic in nature. It must always reveal the king and the kingdom. You must always point to the king and his kingdom. The question is this, will you be led by the Spirit and manifest the gift of the Spirit? Will we live by the Word and be willing to call others back to the Word? Will we be in communion and fellowship with God so that we can hear what He says and be bold to say what we have heard from Him? And we have the greatest example because we have the greatest prophet. Jesus lived this way. We have to ask ourselves, if we are disciples of Jesus Christ, then we learn from Him and we walk His way. So let's bring this to a close. Matthew chapter 13 is the context. I have not forgotten it. Matthew chapter 13 is about the mysteries of the kingdom of God and how some will get it and many will not or they will refuse to get it. You see, this is the environment within which the prophetic ministry operates. The soul of the word is prophetic. The house master that brings out the treasure is prophetic. And Matthew 13, 53, 58 is a transition passage to say, as quickly as Jesus shares this parable, the moment he declares it, people reject him. Who wants to be a prophet? And I want to suggest to you that if, as you are part of this whole aligning initiative in Kingdom 101, I apply this as a test, as an evaluation of what our Keeper's Awakening really is. Do you realize that our Keeper's Awakening is a prophetic message? It's a prophetic ministry. I may not be one called as a prophet or recognized as a prophet, but I recognize that my task and my assignment here is prophetic in nature. 
You see, the awakening comes not because I want to wake people up and disturb people. It came because the Lord said, go wake them up and tell my people they are in slumber. And when we obey this, we obey a prophetic call. Yeah, keep us awakening message is an 11th hour message. There's an eschatological backdrop. We are pointing forward. We are still moving from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And we're telling people, this is what's going to happen. Are you in or are you out? See, when we call people to alignment, it's an invitation to, to check where you are. And are you playing church or are you partnering God in the advancement of the kingdom? The assignment is then for us to know what our part is that we may know and to fulfill what God gives to us. But we must apply the test also, isn't it? You have to ask yourself. And I want you to challenge our keepers awakening on this. Number one, whatever we are doing, is it according to Scripture? And are we moving according to kingdom operating system? Number two, is it consistent with other prophetic voices and movement? Do you know that for the last five and six years, it encourages me to see so many other movements spawning out and sprouting out and people saying the same things but in different ways, not just in Singapore but around the world? Is it affirmed by leaders and elders and the body of Christ? And can I say yes, but you need to check me on this one because you are the body of Christ. If I'm bluffing you, you can shout no right now. We'll shut down this recording. Is it for the glory of Jesus and His kingdom? There's only one name we declare down here. is Jesus. Is it for the profit of the body of Christ? I pray it will be as much as, as it is also a provocation, a wake-up call, a prophetic wake-up call. But as we wake up, May we also edify, exhort, and comfort one another to know that kingdom and silence may not always be done in comfortable times and easy places. But we know we have a glorious hope. Will we be rejected? Possibly. Our keepers? Who? Never heard of me. Who's this crazy guy? Come out of the church and tell people to wake up. Singaporean, uh, ayo. Stay in Bishan one. Uh. What good can come out of Bishan? And sometimes we get no honor because we are local speakers, right? We preach the kingdom. Will we get rejection? Possible. From those who don't want to hear about the kingdom. And sometimes those in the church, in the body of Christ, in the family of God, give you the biggest challenge. But we are encouraged because we know we face the same challenge as Jesus and the apostles. We know about hearing and understanding that many will hear, but we pray as many will understand. We also know it's about family and faith. And that's why your presence here, as within all the other streams of our Keeper's Awakening, encourages me. Because we are not just fellow soldiers, we are family together. And because we believe, we encourage one another. So we open with a question, who wants to be a prophet? I think it's more appropriate if we close with another question. Are you ready to be a prophet? Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this teaching about the prophetic. I know I don't do justice even to this entire ministry of the prophetic. But I pray that with this little bits, the fundamentals as we've gone on and gone over, using a thought, uh, scriptures as our authority, that you stir within us once more to remind us we are a prophetic community. And I pray that we will have that boldness to hear from you and also to speak what you tell us to do. That we are all called and invited and appointed by you. We are all men and women of God. And may we have understanding and revelation, insight prophetically to what you are doing now and in the days ahead and where we each fit in. Lord, we know it's not easy, and many of us may shy away from this. But I pray tonight, Lord, you will lay hold of our hearts once again. And if, as we ask that question, Lord, who wants to be a prophet? It's not by our own choice, Lord. But because you have given us the Spirit, because you have given us the Word, because you have given us access into a relationship with you, who is ready to be a prophet right now? I pray, Lord, help us. As we struggle with this, give us strength, Lord. We know, Lord, everything is done 
by your grace and with your enablement. And so release us, Lord. Send us forth, Lord, that we will bring glory to Jesus through this prophetic gift. And we thank you. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.